Hi, I'm Brooklyn. Thanks for tuning in to Faith Community Online. If you haven't already, take a moment to click the red subscribe button so you're the first one to know the next time we post a video or podcast that will help you connect, grow, and lead right where you're at. And if you'd like to know more about getting connected at Faith Community, stick around at the end for all the ways to do that. We hope you're encouraged to take your next step as you move from where you are to where God wants you to be. Now, for the next two weeks, I just want to share uh, out of the book of Numbers, uh, just something I've been thinking about, been uh, rolling around in. And it happened this way. Last Sunday evening, I uh, went, I always, uh, excuse me, Saturday evening, I always uh, go through my message on Saturday night. I take from the one place I write it in, and then I put it in a Word document that I print out, and then I put it in my Bible. And so I always kind of just do a one final glance through. And so I open up, I use Bible Gateway just to copy and paste uh, from there into my, my uh, document. And it was on Numbers 13. I had been looking at Numbers 13 for something earlier in the week. And I just felt impressed to read uh, Numbers 13 and Numbers 14. It had nothing to do with the message or the interview that we did last week with uh, you know, Pastor Raymond and Adit from Iran. And so I read it, and I was just struck. And what it is is the story of the uh, spies, the 12 spies that they send into the promised land to, to get an idea of what they're walking into and to covertly or clandestine mission of let's get an understanding of what's going on and then let's report back. And I couldn't help but just get stuck in the story and just uh, be drawn into the response of the 10 spies versus the two and the amount of complaining and fear and grumbling that took place when they all had the same exact promise that God had given them. So that's what I want to dig in today. But first, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you, what do you see? Now look at this picture behind me that's going to pop up. I'm going to tell you, what, what do you see here in this picture? How many of you see a duck? Raise your hand. How many of you see a rabbit? Oh, there you go. How many of you have seen this picture before and you already knew what you were looking at? There you go. It's an old picture. But at first, how many of you saw a duck at first? Okay, how many of you saw a rabbit at first? See, very few of us see the rabbit. I saw a duck first. I didn't see a rabbit until I read the underneath part online. I said, oh, there's the rabbit. And I see somebody pointing it out to somebody. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, if you saw a duck, the beak become the ears and then all that kind of stuff. How many of you still don't see a rabbit or a duck? Yeah. Perspective. Isn't it interesting, right? We can all look at the same picture in the same place under the same lighting with, and see two different things. Or maybe you don't see anything at all. That's what we do in life. We can all observe the same thing at the same time and walk away with a different perspective. I see this, you see that. And then from there, it kind of, it, the train leaves the station and we have an attitude about it and we say things about it and we have an opinion about it. But the question is really, what do you see? Because it's so important. What do you see? What do you perceive? Because whatever you see and you perceive, well, then you'll have feelings about it, and then you'll talk about it in a certain way, and you'll go and tell other people, and it'll make a pretty big difference, and it'll have a ripple effect on the base of that. Now, this, who cares whether you saw a duck or a rabbit? It says nothing about you. It's not like if you saw a duck, then you are a happy person. If you saw a rabbit, you're depressed. Not anything like that, okay, at all. But those of you who didn't see the rabbit at first... Once you said there's a rabbit, you could see something that you couldn't see before because the perspective shifted and changed. Now, what's the definition of perspective? I looked it up. I thought that would be interesting. I've never really taken a, a time to look up perspective. And it means this, a particular attitude toward or way of regarding something, a point of view. I never understood or knew that attitude would be related to the definition of perspective, but a particular attitude toward or way of regarding something, a point of view. Not just what you see, but your perspective also takes into, into, into you know, perspective your attitude, how you feel about it. Now, what is the definition of an attitude? I just looked this up right before, so it won't be online. A settled way of thinking or feeling that is typically reflected in a person's behavior. A settled way of thinking or feeling that is typically reflected in a person's behavior. So your perspective takes into, into view your attitude, which can be a settled way of thinking or feeling. Sometimes we come to the table already settled the way that we're going to think or feel about something, and we're not even open to the perspective of someone else. And it's reflected in our behavior. So whatever your perspective is, get this, it's, it's your perspective then you have your attitude, which is then going to be how you talk about it. 
So by the time we are saying something about what we have seen or what we have taken in, into account, we are already now, it is, our attitude is baked into it. And what we're, we're understanding is, is that what our perspective is, is really kind of a compass in a way or a directional force that's setting the course of our lives. And by the time we talk about it, we already feel a certain way and think a certain way, even if we're not fully aware and we're already moving in the direction. Perspective is so important. It's really important. Think about the, the uh, cycle that we're in, the season we're in in our country of election season. How crazy is perspective? You know? I think about, are there attitudes involved in political perspectives? Are there settled ways of thinking and feeling involved in political perspective? Have you sat and talked to someone and it felt like you're talking a different language and about a different thing and it's the same thing you're talking about but you're on totally different sides of the issue and you're like, what's going on? All of it's heightened right now and we are getting, you know, we just played upon our emotions and all of that. And it's like, what do we see? What do we see? Not what do we feel? Not what do I necessarily think right now, but what do I see? That's the question I want to ask is, where, whatever you're facing in life, whatever you may be going through, whatever, you know, if it's not political, that's the easy thing to, to talk about right now. But situations in your life, what do you see? What do you, then what do you think about it? What do you feel about it? Then take inventory. What am I saying about it? Because that's the perspective here. The perspective here is this in the story. And here, here's the story if you're not super familiar. We've got to back all the way up because we have the children of Israel... They are standing at the brink of the promised land. The promised land is the land that God promised to uh, Abraham and his ancestors. This promise is hundreds and hundreds of years old at this point. If we go back to the beginning of Abraham, Genesis 12, which we were there a few weeks ago, God says, Abraham, go to a land that I will show you and I'll give it to you and your ancestors. The land that God would show Abraham is the land of Canaan, which is the promised land. I'm going to give this to you. By the time you get to Genesis 17, I'm not going to read it all. I did in the nine o'clock, but for the sake of time, what God said to Abraham was this. He changed his name from Abram to Abraham, and he says, this covenant that I'm making with you will be for you and your offspring and all of your ancestors, and I will give you the land. I'll give it to you. It's my promise to you. And Abraham was obedient, and he left, and he went. Well, over time, there was a famine, And the nation of Israel ended up going to Egypt. If you remember about Genesis chapter 50, a guy named Joseph went into Egypt because there was a famine and all the nation of Israel went there and then became slaves to the nation of Egypt for over 400 years. The promise was still there. God is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's a covenant-keeping God. Now, in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, this is when God has the, the burning bush to Moses. And this is what he says to Moses. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egypt, hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites. And there's a bunch of ites here. Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. God said, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. All these people inhabit the land right now, and I'm going to give it to you. This is my promise. God, you could say he remembered his promise. Or what he did, he reestablished his promise to Moses, who would then go to Egypt and tell the people, God has heard your cry, and he's going to deliver you and make good on his promise. So that's basically Genesis. Then you get into Exodus, which they're, and they're leaving uh, Egypt. And all these people, so the people that we're going to talk about in just a moment are the people that are all the way back here in Exodus. They get to observe God miraculously deliver them from the most powerful regime on the earth at that time, Egypt. Egypt was like a 4,000-year-old empire. Isn't that amazing? 4,000 years. We've been around like 200 and something. 4,000. We're like a burp, you know, compared to that. (laughs) It's incredible to think about. Anyway, they get to watch God split the Red Sea. Not only that, they watched the 10 plagues. 
that God miraculously delivered them. They get into the wilderness, the journey from Egypt to the promised land, and God provides miraculously for them food. He protects them. He comforts them. His presence is with them. They get to see a lot of amazing things. God reiterating, reestablishing in their hearts and minds the promise that he has for them. I will fight for you. I will provide for you because I am a covenant-keeping God. They know that God is faithful. They've seen it, but there's a problem. They are people. And from Egypt all the way to the promised land, they complain and complain and complain and complain, and it drives Moses crazy. And it drives God crazy too, it seems like. They complain. But here's, here's my point saying all that. They have the promise of God. They have the provision of God. They have the presence of God. They have Uh, so much. And they get to this point, they come in the book of Numbers, and this is what God tells them to do, because they're getting ready to go into the promised land. They're on the precipice of, of getting to where God had always promised them. And Moses says, what should we do? And God says this. Here's the mission he gives them, Numbers 13, one through three. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send me to spy out, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving. Here's the promise in the beginning. Send them to spy out, which I am giving. Not that you are taking or you are conquering, but I, God, am giving. Present progressive tense. He's doing it right now. That's the grammar for the day. To the people of Israel, for from each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a chief among them. So Moses sent from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all them men who were heads of the people of Israel. God says, okay, I want you to send 12 leaders. There were 12 tribes of of Israel. I want you to send 12 men on a 40-day mission, what it happens to be, go out and spy the land and test and see if what I've said is right and then come back with a good report, basically, and tell the people. But he says, I am giving this to you, okay? I, God, am doing it. They select 12. They give the name of of all 12. I only remember two, Joshua and Caleb. One's easy because it's my name. The reason why I remember both of them is because two out of the 10 have a good report. Two out of the 12, excuse me, have a good report. If you're doing math, you know that's a very small percentage. Less than 20%. Have a good report. 10 have a negative report. We'll read the report here in a moment. But don't forget, all 12 have a history with God. All 12 have walked the same journey. All 12 have been delivered from Egypt. All 12 have eaten the miraculous manna that appears on the ground every morning. All 12 have seen the cloud by day, fire by night. They have been witness to God's faithfulness. They've seen it all. And now they get to go to the land that God promised Abraham, I don't know, four to five, six, seven hundred years ago. I don't know the time frame. They have this promise passed down to them. It's part of who they are. And they all go on the same journey, witness the same things, and come back with a very different perspective. And it has consequences. Isn't it interesting? I think about in church, I've been in church my whole life. You would think we'd be the most unified group on the planet. We all read the same book, (laughs) profess to believe in the same Lord, and then we can't even agree sometimes on which songs we should sing. (laughs) Think about that. So this is not a problem unique to the children of Israel. This is a problem unique to humanity. That's why Jesus' prayer, I think, becomes, it's become more apparent to me over the 10 years of pastoring, not because there's big problems, I just understand it more. I pray that they would be one. Even as the Father and I are one, they would be united. They would be unified. Not uniform in everything they do, but united on what? Who God is. The character of God. The faithfulness of God who he has revealed himself to be, but they can't be. And so here they come back with the report. Here's the report, Numbers 13, we're gonna read 25 through 29. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron, to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. Who are they gonna give the report to? Everybody. Men, women, and children are going to be standing there listening to this. They brought back the word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So what do they do? They say, yeah, it's true. What God said, land flowing with milk and honey, what does that mean? It's a euphemism for it's going to be a fruitful, bountiful land for you. It's true. Look, here's the fruit. 
Part of the passage says, the grapes are so big that two men have to carry the vine in between them. Like, it's true. God, what God said is right. But then it says, however. A fancy way to say, but. Yeah, what God said is true, but here's all the reasons why we cannot go. The people who dwell there are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negeb. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. What did God say in Exodus? I will take you to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. God already said, I will deliver you. He already said at the beginning of this, I am giving you the land. He, he knows what's coming ahead. But they see it all and they say, we cannot do this. I love what Caleb, I said through 29, I meant more than 29. Anyway, through 33. But, here's, here's a good but. The last one's a bad but, here's a good but, okay? But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it for we are well able to overcome it. So the majority of the, of the spies, these are trusted men who lead the community. Their voice carries weight. I love Caleb because he's willing to stand up in front of the majority and say, no, 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 no. We can do it. Let's go. God's faithful. God's good. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up. So they're disagreeing with Caleb. Sound like a good church meeting you've been at sometimes? We are not able to go up against the people for they're stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy spy out, it is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw it are of great height. Talk about, we saw that there are the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. So you got Caleb, he's the only voice right now. Joshua will jump in later. Caleb's saying, no, we can do it, God's faithful. And they're saying, no, we can't. Basically, here's what they're saying. Yeah, it may be the land that God said it is, but we don't trust that he's good and faithful enough to deliver it, and we don't think he's going to fight for us, and we're going to prioritize ourselves, and it doesn't really matter what God said. We can't do it. Why? Because we're afraid. Because we're afraid. You know, fear will never lead you into the promises of God in your life. Ever. I'm not saying that if you're afraid to walk out in front of, on the interstate in front of moving cars that you're going to miss the promises of God. No. No, that'll probably keep you safe more, more than anything. I'm just talking about fear in general, like the overwhelming, incapacitating fear. God does not work through fear, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. It is impossible to please the Lord without faith, and faith is a gift that he gives us. Fear. Let me ask you, how easy is it for you to find every reason not to do something? How many people in here are good at finding all the reasons not to do something? Yeah. How many of you are really good at finding the reasons not to obey God? Oh, I'm going to keep my hand up. I know what the answer should be. And I'm not talking about things that are super clear in Scripture. I'm not talking about like, should I murder, should I not? No, that's a pretty easy one, pretty easy one. I'm talking about God maybe leading you in a direction in your family or asking you to do something. Maybe it's a job change. Maybe it's a, we're going to change the way uh, that we parent. Or maybe it's financially, we're going to start to trust God financially. And we're going, to, we're going to do this like tithing thing that he asks about or this generosity thing. And it's like, I can find every reason in the world not to do that. And they're good reasons. Meaning they're logical and they make sense and they reflect well on paper. There is no blessing in fear. There's only blessing in faith and obedience. And you have these 10 people who have been witness to it all. Because sometimes we say things like this. If only God would rain down manna for me. Proverbially. If only God would do this thing for me, then I would trust him more. And can I tell you, maybe, but probably not. How many demonstrations would we need? Gideon in the Old Testament's like, if you, okay, I'm going to put out this fleece. And if it's, I want there to be dew on the ground, but no dew on the fleece. Okay, he does that. Okay, now, God, what I want you to do is, I want there to be dew on the fleece and no dew on the ground. So he does that. Okay, now, God, here's what, it just keeps going on and on and on and on. No, no, no. 
It's, do I have faith? No, I've been witness to God's faithfulness, to his character, to everything he said in his word, and he is a covenant-keeping God. Covenant-keeping. What does that mean? He will do what he said he would do. Even when you and I are faithless, he is faithful. And this is what you have going on. Less than 20% are saying, you know, because Joshua will jump in and say, no, God, God is fighting for us. He's brought us to this point. He's taken us out of Egypt, all through the wilderness, to right here. All we have to do is step foot in the direction that God is moving, and he will deliver us and give us this land. That's the only proper response. This is a testing of their faith. It really is. Do you want to know the result of their fear and the result of their criticism? Here's what it says in in 14. It says, then all the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled and complained basically against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, here's what they said to Moses and Aaron. Would that we had died in the land of Egypt or we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Wow. You ever wonder why Moses struck that rock at the end of the script, at the end of the time? There's nothing Moses could do it was good enough for them. It's so fascinating that God had done all this stuff. They had been crying out for hundreds of years in Egypt. God deliver us. God deliver us, and he does, and they get to the point where God is going to, they are, more, they are closer to the promised land than they've ever been. They can smell it. They can see it. They're eating grapes that they brought back, and it's there as they are closest to the freedom, closest to all that God has, that they say, nah, I'd rather be in Egypt. I'd rather be a slave. I'd rather die in the wilderness. Moses, I don't like you anymore. Give me another leader. How often is it in our lives sometimes that we, we pray for God to do something, And God does it, and God brings us what we think we want, and then that thing, let's just call it a leader, you know, that leader, that pastor, whatever you want to say. I'm not saying you've done this, but, you know, just imagine there's some people that do this. And that thing, that person starts leading you in the direction that God is calling, okay, that God has set out in his word, and all of a sudden you say, I don't like that anymore. It's uncomfortable for me. It's requiring something for me that I don't, I don't want to give. All right, God, give me a new leader. Give me something else. I don't like this anymore. I don't like what you're doing anymore. And what happens is, is you start to prioritize, I do this too, your own comfort and your own sensibilities over what God has for you. Saying, God, do what I want you to do when I want you to do it and how I want you to do it. I don't like what you're doing anymore. I wish you just left me back there. Which prayer request do you want him to answer? Or do you just want to be God yourself? This is the condition of humanity. It really is. Because when we see the Old Testament, we see the journey from Egypt to the promised land. It's the journey from sin to salvation. And the people are free in the wilderness. They're not slaves anymore, but they are still slaves right here and right here in their heart. Listen to what one commentator said. He said, significantly, the two men see the exact same sights. He's talking about Caleb and the other guy. The same grapes, the same men, the same land, the same cities. One can come away singing in faith and the other is filled with a sense of certain doom. Ultimately, faith or unbelief does not spring from circumstances or environment, but from hearts which God must change. What are we seeing here? We're seeing the condition of the children of Israel. We're seeing their hearts and they're not turned towards God. You can think your situation is determining your perspective. Your situation is determining what you're saying. I'm saying it's your heart responding to the situation. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Here's my second question. What are you saying? What do you see? What are you saying? You ever get angry uh, in an argument and say something you don't mean? I'm going to tell you that's what you mean. You said what you mean. No, 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 I'm, I'm sorry that I said it. I, don't, I know you're sorry, but that didn't just pop in your head in the moment. Let's be honest. Well, I'll be honest. Okay. I have said things to an unnamed woman. 
in, in an argument. And I have been sorry for them. But when I'm honest with myself, what I said began as a thought or an offense, an emotion that I held on to, that I rehearsed, that I wasn't honest about, that I hid deep within my heart. And in a moment of stress, anger, anxiety, fear, whatever you call it, that the abundance of my heart spoke in that moment. That's what I meant. Because that's what I believe. I just finally got to a point where I was willing to say it. Does that add a new perspective? That, that, get, that doesn't let you off the hook because you can't just be mad and say whatever, say whatever you want and apologize. I was just mad. No, that's what you meant because that's what your heart is right now. And that's what God wants to change. See that as a gift. You're going to have to deal with the collateral damage of it. But you were just finally honest. And now God's saying, ah, now we can work. Let me deal with that heart. Because when I don't say what I mean, yeah, I'm being nice, but I'm not being honest. Now, I'm not saying just walk out of here and start blitzing each other with everything you want to say. <laughs> but I'm saying don't excuse yourself because oh, I was just angry. Oh, I was just afraid. No, that's the true you. Now, God's saying, let me give you my heart. Let me create within you a clean heart. Let me show you the mind of Christ in the situation. And can I tell you that... Um, You'll never get there by complaining. Right. How many complainers I got in a room? Okay, thank you for being honest. Have you ever complained your way out of a problem? Maybe a job. <laughs> Maybe a relationship. You complained your way from one problem to another. You never complain your way to a resolution. Grumbling and complaining. I think God hates let me, let me I'll tell you what Paul said. So you can blame Paul, not Josh. <laughs> Here's what Paul said. Sec, uh, not second, Philippians 2. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life that on the day of Christ's return, I'll be proud that I did, that I did not run the race in vain and that my works were not useless. The part I really wanted to say, he said, do everything without complaining and arguing. I'm not telling you to not have an opinion. I'm not telling you to not offer constructive criticism. I'm not telling you to look at a situation and ignore things that need to be fixed. But I am telling you that there's a big difference between saying, hey, I think you could do this better, and this whole thing is horrible. These people don't know what they're doing. If I was running the show, then this is what I would do, and blah, 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 blah. You ever, you ever put something together for a group of people and you put a lot of time and thought into it and then you get everybody there and you're doing something and then there's that one person who just wants to complain about everything? Well, you didn't think of this. Well, what if you had done this? And I'm like, what if you weren't here? <laughs> think about that. I, I just don't know about you, but complaining just makes me want to quit. It's like, holy cow. Can I tell you there's nothing holy about complaining? There's no gift of complaining in the Lord. Like you can, you can speak the truth in love and we can do all that and we can grow together. But I'm talking about complaining and grumbling. Look at these, here are these people. Give us another leader. You'd rather die in Egypt. And you want to know the reality of the story? God gives them what they want. Fine. He can see their heart. You don't want to go to the promised land. Your heart is still in Egypt. So I'm going to allow you to die in the wilderness. And you will never get in. Not because of me. Because God, I'm willing, I'm able, I provided, I brought you out, I will fight for you, I'll do all that. But if you can't trust that, you can't live in the promised land. So you're going to die in the, here in the wilderness and then your offspring will go to the promised land. That's one of the harsh realities of the Bible that you got to deal with. Well, why would God be so harsh? We'll talk more about that next week, but I'll give you an insight why I think he's so harsh. I don't think he's harsh at all. What they accused God of is the same thing that Moses accuses God of when he strikes the rock rather than speaks to the rock is this. They accuse him of not being a covenant-keeping God. You are not who you say you are. You will not do what you said you would do. Think about it this way. 
with Jesus. If you refuse to accept the finished work of Jesus Christ, and by the way, Jesus is the promised land. It's not a location. If you refuse to accept the sacrifice, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you will not enter the promised land because you will not trust in the covenant that God has given to his people and you and I. And that is not God choosing to keep you out of the promised land. That's you exercising your will and not receiving what he has for you. That is a judgment, but you chose it. I can choose it. They made a decision. You ever think by your grumbling and complaining you're making a decision? You are choosing to orient your life in the direction of complaining and fear and a bad perspective. Now, if you don't do that, great, I'm not talking to you. But I think we all do that in certain situations in areas of our lives. Faith or fear is a choice. What do you see and what are you saying? What I find interesting here is Moses has a decision of who he's going to listen to. Does he listen to consensus? Because consensus does not always equal God's will. God does not work by committee. You ever figure that out? God does not work by democracy. I know that's anti-American. We don't vote God in. And we don't vote him out. I want you to think about this for a moment. Okay, I had this thought. And this is not reflective of this church at all. But just think about this, okay? Think about this. This is a modern day example, I think, of what happens. I'm kind of nervous, but go with me. Give me grace. <laughs> Think about there are churches out there who rotate pastors every year and a half to three years. Not because the, the overarching governing body moves the bishop in and out, but because the people can vote on who they want to be their pastor. And, pe and these churches get stuck in what I call the wilderness because a pastor comes in, they want to move forward, they want what God wants, so they vote who they think that they want and who God wants. The pastor starts moving in a direction that people don't like, so the people vote the pastor out because they don't like what the pastor's doing, and they get stuck in this perpetual cycle of not moving forward, and the church is stagnating and dying, and you're like, what's God doing? He's giving you what you want. You don't want to move. You want to stay where you're at. Now, I think that happens in churches, but think about families now, because that didn't seem to be a good, fun example about the churches. <laughs> Think about our families. We want our families to change. We want generational curses to be broken. And God comes in and says, if you want this to change, I got all power and all authority, but I, I, the only thing I'm gonna require from you is move in my direction. And if you as parents don't move in the direction of God and don't do what God has created and, and ordained for his process to happen, he will give you what you want, which is to be stuck in your perpetual cycle of dysfunction. You can be saved and go to heaven, but be stuck in a cycle of dysfunction here on earth because you refuse to trust God. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? It's not God withholding. It's that God doesn't violate mine and your will. Do you choose to follow him or do you not? I have set before you life and death choose you this day. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Choose this day. How gracious is God that he will give you over to your will? I don't like that. Sometimes we do. God, give me what I want. But sometimes the worst prayer request we could ever get an answer to is for God to turn us over to what we really want. That's what happens here. And we'll see the story progress even more next week, their response to God's judgment. But I just wanted to ask you, what areas in, of your life or what issues are you facing where you have an opportunity to give a good report or a bad report? Moses chooses to listen to the two. He recognizes that consensus is not always God's will. Yes, there is a wis there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel, but it depends on the counsel you're getting if you surround yourself with idiots, you're gonna get idiot counsel, right? You can get 10 idiots at a table and idiotic things are gonna arise out of that. But if you surround yourself with wise, God-fearing people, you're gonna get good wisdom. 
So that would be my question. Who's at your table? If you find yourself with a bad attitude and bad stuff, you know, you're just negative about what's saying, what's going on, all that, and you surround yourself with people who agree with you, that's not a recipe for success. I don't know about you, but I look for consensus when I'm feeling negative. I want people to come and enjoy the pain with me. Yes, come and agree with me how mean these people are. I mean, that's what social media has done. You can get people to agree with you no matter what. You form a little group on Facebook and just go to town being negative, right? That's been part of our problem as a society. We've formed into herds and groups that share the same misgivings and we can't see the positive because our perspective is being reinforced by people who think just like we do. But we need people who, don't, who think differently. I'm grateful for the leadership structure of this church that there are people in positions of authority here that aren't impressed by me. That's a good thing. You need people in your life that aren't impressed by you and that will hold you accountable. Hey, I can't tell you, there's been a number of times here I've gone for the leadership. I think we should do this and I want to blah, blah, blah and I want to do this and let's go tomorrow. And then they're like, how about we think about this for a little bit? I'm like, what do you mean, we? I've thought about this a lot. That's why I'm bringing it to you so you can sign off. No, hey, Josh, you've been doing this for three years and you know, you're 33 years old and while we respect you, maybe there's wisdom in waiting. Can I tell you, they've been more right than they've been wrong. Well, they've always been right, I'll be honest with you. It didn't mean that I was wrong. It meant the timing was off. It meant that I was narrow focused and they had a broader perspective to say, hey, Josh, you're seeing a duck. We see the rabbit, okay? And while the duck's good, you need to, make, you need to be, pay, be aware there's a rabbit too. It's good. And you need people who are willing to risk offense to tell you the truth. Not people who just want to offend you. But they're going to prioritize the truth and your well-being over how you feel at any given moment or time. Those are good people to have in your life. Your spouse should be a person like that too if you're married. They should tell you the truth because they love you and you love them. Because the last thing we need are bad reports. They're full of them. We can get bad reports all the time. But what we need is a good report. The question is, can we recognize the good report? I think it's amazing. Caleb had one sentence. Hey, hey, guys, guys. Ah, shut up, Caleb. All the ites are going to kill us. And then the people, ah! weep, grumble, complain. Their minds were made up. Their minds had been made up since they left Egypt, in my opinion. They are afraid. I get it. But where are we? What do we see? What are we saying? And do we believe that he is a covenant-keeping God and that he's faithful and that he's good? Let me end with this story. I started with this in the nine o'clock and went in. I heard it, it has to do with the 21 days, but I think it fits here too. Uh, Friday night, Lauren and I went to a, a benefit for Guatemala. It was at Cross Point and uh, I was doing a little thing and so we were there and Philip Craig and Dean did a concert for a benefit. It was really cool. I enjoyed it a lot. I don't know how I was gonna uh, you know, feel about it, but I just was blessed on many different levels. And, and there's a song that they do called Tell Your Heart to Beat Again. And I'd never heard the song and Randy Phillips told the story about the song. And he said that he wrote that song because there was a pastor friend, I think of his or his father, who was like an adrenaline junkie and just liked to jump out of planes and all kinds of stuff. And he found out that in his church was a, uh, one of the number one heart surgeons in all of Ohio. And so he asked him, he said, hey, can I observe an open heart surgery? I want to see you crack the chest open, blah, blah. And the guy said, okay. And so he goes in, there's a woman on the table and they do the thing. They open her up, crack her ribs, pull the heart out. He watches them work on the heart, sew it up, whatever needs to be done. And apparently to get the heartbeat going again, they can like tap the heart if they put it in and try to massage it. And they couldn't get the heart to start. He was thinking to himself, um, I'm going to watch this woman die on the table. And he said, then the surgeon did something that was, was totally off of this guy's radar and just... He went over to the head of the table where the woman was. She's on a breathing machine, ventilator, whatever. And he, he kneels down and he whispers in her ear, Mrs. Smith, we have taken your heart out. The surgery has gone well. We have repaired your heart. We've put it back in. We can't get your heart to beat. And he said, Mrs. Smith, tell your heart to beat again in her ear. And the heart began to beat. The 
somewhere from deep within the recesses of that lady and her brain, whatever the case may be, her heart began to beat. I think this pastor or surgeon wrote a book about it, and then Randy Phillip ended up writing a song about it. You say, why do you tell us that story? I don't know, I thought it was amazing. Here's what I mean. Maybe we are, have a negative perspective, a hurt perspective, and we're struggling to trust God because of what we've been through. We're scared. We're afraid. They don't have a lot of hope because of everything crowding in on us, all the details, all the giants, you know, proverbially. Is it possible that sometimes what faith looks like, what hope looks like, is to hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit saying, tell your heart to beat again. There's hope. There's a confident expectation of future good. I am giving you this land. Now, everything within you wants to be afraid. Everything within you wants to speak negatively. But what I'm gonna ask you to do is speak to the affirmative, not of positive thinking, but of in faith upon God's word of who he is and what he's done. That he's a covenant-keeping God. And those words have to come out of your mouth. What are you saying about your situation? Are you choosing to express just your humanity? Are you choosing, choosing to take inventory of your humanity and say, God, this is how I feel. But what I stand upon is you've not given me the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And you are faithful and you are good. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive of the things that you'll do. Right? Just begin to confess God's word and who he is and his faithfulness. Because it's a choice. So next week, we get to watch the people respond after they're judged. How exciting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everybody in this room today, everybody watching online. I pray that you would, you would just help us, Lord, to, to have a perspective that comes from you, that we see what it is that you have laid out for us. Yes, we take an inventory of all the things that we're going through, but we, we set those things aside and we choose to trust in your faithfulness and the demonstrated power that you've shown us in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as we walk out of here today, our faith would be strengthened and encouraged and that we'd be able to see you begin to move. And as Paul prayed, that it would be exceedingly and abundantly above anything we could ask for or imagine according to the power that's at work within us. And that is the power of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Thanks for joining us online today. We would love to connect with you. So here are a few ways you can do that. If you're new here, or you made the decision to follow Jesus today, text NEW TO FAITH to 97000. One of our team members will follow up soon with details about how you can take your next step at Faith Community. We also believe that God cares about the needs going on in your life. So no matter where you're joining from, we would love to pray for you. Email prayer at faithcommunity.co with your prayer request. You can always learn more about the church at faithcommunity.co and stay connected on social media. Shoot us a message on Facebook or Instagram to say hello. And finally, click the red subscribe button and the bell icon so you're the first to know when new content is available. Thanks again for joining us online today. We'll see you next time.